just ask you a quick question. What do the words masala masala mean to you? Have you got what it takes to be an entrepreneur? Is it something that you feel is in your blood? Could you raise capital, master supply chain theory, submit business plans, financial forecasts and invoices, not to mention deal with buyers, suppliers and the consumer? The sad fact is that 9 out of 10 raw startups will fail. And I used to spend every evening invoicing. It's a really high stress, low income. I was a courier for about three days. You're living on coffee and Mars bars. Did the marketing myself, wrote all my own press releases. There'll be other people out there who are going to do it faster, better, smarter than you. So you've got to get started. The question mark is, where do you take it from here? At the age of 27, Priya Lakhani threw in her successful career in the city to strike out on her own as an independent businesswoman. I was, I was working late nights as a lawyer, um, coming home quite late. And um, I was looking around the supermarket and there were no fresh Indian sauces on the shelf. There were only the sauces on the ambient shelf, um, you know, the world cuisine shelf. But those sauces last, you know, six months, a year, two years. What's in them to make them last that long? So I, I looked and looked and looked for a fresh new sauce and I just couldn't find one and that's when I realised, hang on, I don't think there actually is one, I don't think anyone's ever introduced one. But the pasta sauces are selling so well, you know, they're just people are taking them in practically every second or third basket in a supermarket, you will see a fresh sauce. So that's when I obviously just thought, but you know, ping, you know, it, it's a, fre a fresh food company, fresh ethnic food company. Then I did the research and that's how Masala Masala was born. I've always had this itch to be an entrepreneur and to run my own business. And also because I have had a career, I've had a professional career as a barrister. Um, I've worked in large organisations. And I think, you know, if you're that sort of person where you're always working for somebody else, but you want to start your own business, you want to start your own enterprise, you want to manage other people maybe, you could say it's in your blood because there's a constant itch there. I can't speak English well, but I just know that just one word, delicious. Great. <laughs> yeah. I always think of a successful entrepreneur venture, usually it starts with two people. There's usually a, an inside person and an outside person. There's a, there's a great story about uh, the two founders of Pret-a-Manger, uh, Julian Metcalf and Sinclair Beecham. And uh, Julian describes the start-up of Pret-a-Manger, which is now a hugely successful uh, uh, global sandwich chain, uh, as without me, Pret wouldn't exist. Without him, Sinclair, it wouldn't work. For Masala Masala, I decided that my secret weapon would be my mother. So I enlisted her free of charge to be my creative director. By using her mother to set up the business, Priya helped to give her company a USP to set her apart from her competitors. A USP can be a bundle of benefits to the customer. Something that's slightly different, maybe a different price point for the same thing, or maybe some extra features packaged in a different way. Something that makes you distinctive. So my mother will create proper Indian food, whether it's from Gujarat, from Punjab, from South India. And uh, I will take those small little, those recipes and then produce them on a mass scale for my customers here at the supermarkets in general. Um, and I'll make sure they taste exactly the same as my mother's. I will also make sure that the ingredients are as fresh as what my mother's using in her own kitchen. There's a great example with Levi Roots' reggae reggae sauce and the way that he made a fantastic initial impact from Dragon's Den onto a consumer brand. I mean, that was brilliantly done, totally memorable. And that was enough. I mean, it's only a hot pepper sauce, but you know, it was a great sedge. You know, so that's a, that could be you. It could be the person. It could be the character of the, of the brand. Priya and her mother often meet up to discuss fresh ideas. And currently, they're working on a new product range. The three sources have been doing really, really well, but I've been receiving um, some emails from customers um, basically saying that some of them would like a slightly spicier sauce. Okay, what do you think about having, you know, like fresh ginger, garlic, onions, and make it more chilli, hot, Yeah. and uh, if you want it creamy, we can add some yoghurt. So, in between all of this, I will get consumers, to, I'll find out what consumers want. Um, and then what I'll do is we'll put them in the pots and I will go and batch test them.
We had so many requests for a spicy version that I just spoke to buyers in the supermarkets and said, look, you know, your customers are requesting this, so what should we do? And they said, yeah, can you produce one for us? It is spicy. <laughs> it is spicy. <laughs> but it's amazing. Mmm, -hmm. mm, yummy. I love it. Yeah. There are thousands of companies operating in the UK and they vary enormously in the numbers of staff and profit margins. But they are all alike in one way. They all have to be registered and anyone who needs financial backing must have a detailed business plan at the outset to show how they're intending to make their profits. Uh, a business plan should be a short document that articulates your assumptions about how your market works, how your industry works, how you're going to run the business and who's going to be involved. So it's really a roadmap that helps you think about in advance the route you're going to take. You're just answering very simple questions. What's your product? What's your service? Who is your market? You know, what's your market? Who are your customers? What makes your company different? What's your USP? What's your unique selling point? What makes your company so different? If you're stuck, you know, there's lots of books about how to write a business plan, but go and ask someone who's written one before that's been successful. And along with every business plan comes a financial forecast. Financial forecast is your assumption about how the finances of the business will evolve over time. So if, put it simply, how many do you think you're going to sell next week, the week after, in the month's time, in, over the next year? So at the top level, it's going to be about sales. It's also then going to be forecasting how much I've got to pay myself, how many people I'm going to have to hire, what's the cost of them, working all that through to whether you're actually going to have a surplus or whether you're going to have to have a, whether you'll, whether you'll have a deficit, which means you're going to have to raise some money from outside. Understandably, people in the same industry as me might not want to help me because I'm about to compete with them. So I called actually a, a Sawyer company and I said, I'm really stuck. Please, will you help me? And they sent me their costing sheet. And they said, this is confidential and it's just to get you on your feet. And with that costing sheet, I understood how a company can grow from small to big. And I managed to do my financial forecast. Priya followed this advice and she used her own savings as a healthy startup loan to launch her business. She then took her idea to food trade shows where the all-important buyers could taste her sauces and sign her up. And by doing this, she managed to secure some high-level clients and she began selling her chilled curry sauces to premium food outlets nationwide. So, great, you've thought of an idea. Great, you've got a business plan. You've got a, pro you know, a name. You've got a company's house involved and you've got your registration certificates. And um, you've got a client, a great big client that you're very proud of. Um, who's going to run the business? Well, it's you. And it's a full-time job. Fresh and chilled are the hardest sectors to operate in because the stock turns have to be that much higher. I.e., if you've got a product that only has a shelf life of five days and it has to have a sell-by date on it, then you've got to have a very, very efficient supply chain. Don't forget that it's not just going from a storage company onto the shop shelf. It's going from a storage company to a depot. The depot is distributing it to the store. It goes to the back of the store. The big, you know, at the back we see all the crates. Back of the store, some person is taking it out of the shelf and putting it on the shelf. It's completely different to making you know, tomato ketchup. You bottle it in a factory, you ship it to a warehouse, it might sit there for a month, you ship it to the supermarket, it might sit there for two months, who cares? You know, it's, it's, it's not going to go off. Whereas fresh food, you've got to have a very, very fast turnaround. It makes it very hard for startups to do well in that area. Managing logistics effectively is paramount to maintain cash flow and keep clients supplied with the product. But along with logistics, marketing is also crucially important and no business can survive without these two key components. So I'm on my way to go see Mystery, uh, my design team, and talk to them about the design of the labels for the packaging of their fresh sauces. It's me, stranger. Oh, you look really well. How are you doing? You all right? Sorry. Priya believes that part of the initial success of her business was in building a strong brand identity to communicate her USP. 
and she devoted crucial funds from her startup loan to seek professional advice to achieve this. Um, so we just picked up on some of the sort of the key areas that, yeah. that you've mentioned. Um, obviously, a contemporary brand, um, but still important: the authenticity, you know, the real Indian nature yeah, uh, to exactly. the source. Um, the uniqueness that you've mentioned about the, the freshness of the sauce and yeah. being nothing else out there at the moment, um, and very seems to be very important to you as well. Sort of the, the ethical stance in terms of um, the, the, the charitable arm of the yeah. product, um, which is, again we've taken on board as something that we really need to communicate. Branding is absolutely at the heart of consumer products. It's what differentiates your cornflakes from anybody else's cornflakes. I mean, they are fundamentally the same. I mean, it's how do you then get somebody to express a preference and how do you build trust with your consumers? And that's what brands do. They're about a contract between you and your consumers. It's great that, you know, your, rea your reaction to this is exactly the sort of reaction we're looking for yeah. in design because the, what we're looking for is an emotive response with, a, with any type of design, but specifically when we're trying to build a brand. With a, with a, with a brand that people really connect with, yeah. They find more about more out about the brand over time, so they'll find out to start with that it's a modern, it's a contemporary Indian all natural product. Yeah. Um, then they take it home. They find out there's an ethical stance and there's, there's a really powerful, um, you know, uh, message there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean I, I love the way you just described that because I think it's recognised that the message about the the ethical message will be a bit later on at home, and and I like the fact there's three different points because surely that's more powerful rather than. You know, a brand can just go boom and it can, yeah. you know, it be in your face, really. Yes, exactly. And then you go home and you forget about it, whereas this is constant. I can't wait to try it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An important part of the brand is the ethical side to the business, where Priya guarantees that proceeds from every pot she sells go to worthy causes in India. And for Priya, this was a part of her business plan from the start. We've been donating money to our NGO partners in India. The main things that we want to work on are on the ground nutrition, healthcare, and education. And then we want to work with charities like Save the Children on sustainability projects, so training people about their rights and empowering people. Um, and uh, it's an incredibly important part of our business, and Miss Armstrong would not exist without it. But giving money to charity doesn't help the bottom line, especially when you're in the midst of a global recession which has caused so many small businesses like Priya's to fold. In a recession, uh, people don't stop eating. So food industry is actually quite a good place to be. Masala Masala itself has benefited slightly from the recession in that people aren't eating out as much. They don't go to restaurants as much. They want to eat in. The challenge is uh, in recessionary times, people tend to shift away from premium brands to value brands. And for Priya, I think going in with a premium brand, the fact that she's got through the year and is doing apparently pretty well, that's a fantastic sort of um, tick in the box. Masala Masala broke even at 12 months. So, you know, we're very, very happy to have done that in the first year. We're happy to have survived the first year because apparently 60% of businesses don't make it to the first year. Um, and that's a real shame because no one's saying you have to get it right first time. But the idea is to, is to keep learning from your mistakes, ask questions, learn from people who've already been successful. Um, and, and that way, you know, you'll, 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 you'll achieve what you want to do. It just, just takes a little bit of time sometimes. <laughs>